All right, all right, all right. <laughs> so we are on center. Yeah. It's and uh, this is our second time together. Yeah. Which feels great. And maybe, uh, maybe we could even do just a little check-in of like how our week has been. Uh, wow. It's <laughs> a little like. <laughs> or two weeks. Ah, or two three weeks, weeks or yeah. something like that. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Because I went away to the traditional waste gathering. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I learned about traditional skills. Yeah. Up it was on Lake Superior. It was gorgeous. The weather was perfect. The lake mm. was amazing. If anybody ever wants to take a superb family vacation, I so recommend going to the Lake Superior Traditional so, Ways Gathering. Did your boys go too? Um, Andre did not go, my older boy, but my younger son and I went and we met some friends up there. And um, The time before I'd gone with a friend and met her and um, she really helped. She had brought like a little portable gas stove and we were all kind of set up. This time I came and just met a different friend and um, just grabbed some nuts and just threw things in a cooler and we um, made fires for cooking some of the nights and it was much looser but it was really fun and then I ended up yeah I ended up eating with different people and there ended up being extra I brought some uh, meats and things, and then there ended up being extra food that people shared, and oh, that's yeah, wonderful. it was really, really great. I yeah, was actually I had more food than I needed. I was actually just at or an, or an organic meat farm uh -huh. in Central Illinois, and it was just lovely uh, to see how much pasture and and just all these animals just roaming free, and then to eat the meat from mm -hmm. the farm. It just felt so nourishing, and the people who care for the animals are just so incredibly caring. Like mm -hmm. they're just like really nice people. And they're really caring to the animals. I mean, it was just lovely. What farm were you at? It's called Mint Creek. Me? Mint. Mint Creek. Mint Creek. And um, the Carr family, um, Harry Carr, he owns it. And um, it's his family farm, and uh, it's a really great little business. And the, they um, are about an hour and a half from Chicago, so they mm -hmm. sell to Chicago markets. And... Um, um, John Glaber, who's a local here in River West, some people might recognize him because he rides his bike with, um, he has goat horns on his helmet mm -hmm. on his bike, mm -hmm. so people might recognize him from that, but um, yeah, that's where he's been uh, for the past uh, little under a year, but he came back this summer to Milwaukee to revisit, he used to work at Growing Power. Um, and I knew him from my housemate, Kate. So, so yeah, it's been really nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think you met him at Joe's meditation meditation last week. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Oh, and contact improv. Contact improv. Yeah, I danced with them some. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so he's just a wonderful person. So he works there. And he just loves the animals. I mean, it's just so sweet to see the interaction between the humans and the animals. Mm -hmm. It's just really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, and then should we, so that was what we both went away and why we missed each other. And then you had the, the Whitefish Bay Farmers on. And then I just talked last week all about my experience at the teaching drum. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, I decided to homeschool my youngest son, Gio, who is six right now. So that was a big decision. And um, I also decided to go get a yoga certification program. So, oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. So I had a big week in, in making decisions. Yeah. Oh my gosh! And how did you, right. you just kind of? I know, you're pretty intentional in, in in your decisions, and that's just what did just come, the yoga certification in particular. Did you have you felt that for a while? I have thought it, about it off and on in my life, and then um, actually a, a friend suggested going to Kundalini yoga certification, which I was really interested in because I've been take, studying it a little bit with her. And um, it ended up feeling a little bit too rushed to actually do the Kundalini, which was in Chicago. But it kind of reawakened my like, what? Well, yeah, I've always thought about doing this. Why haven't I done it? And um, uh, I'm actually writing a little blog about it. I have had some body issues that sometimes were aggravated by yoga. And um, having been at Teaching Drum, it really helped me heal a lot of the issues that were going on with my body. Mm. So I feel really much more able to kind of dive into the yoga again. Mm. And I'm um, excited about the pink house and everything. So it just felt right all of a sudden. Yeah. And I know um, that there's all this mind-body connection stuff and talk. Mm. And um, I've been really seeing the tremendous value for myself so I don't know if the teaching drum it wasn't just like the physical or was it the physical or both 
spiritual and physical that you felt like you were talking about healing at the teaching drum? Okay. Wow. There's so many things here. First yeah. of all, the because mm. uh, we were actually we we're going to talk about flagging. How about we go into um, me kind of doing a little wrap up for what I wanted to do about the yeah, teaching drum thing, and then sure. we go back to this because the fact that I made the decision is something that I was flagged about a teaching drum. I was flagged for being a waffler, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which was a pattern I hadn't really <laughs> seen in myself before. But now, since then, I'm like, oh yeah, wow, that does come up. I want everything, so I often don't quite make a decision. And so we had talked about patterns being part of this show. Yeah, a bit. Well, what I was thinking was just how it was interesting that I went to this outdoor school and um, that it's about this, like, nature survival often is what people think about a wilderness survival school. And um, really one of the things they emphasize the most are more the soft skills, the inner skills, knowing yourself, speaking the truth to yourself, and working with others, interpersonal skills. And um, a lot of the work we used, we um, was were a lot of the work we did was ar about that around that and um how really survival skills right like learning how to make a fire or um set a trap are are skills you would need in certain survival situations but the foundation of what you need because we're social creatures and um is how you connect with other people and how you yourself are motivated and how you look at a situation. So if there's an emergency and instead of facing it calmly and creatively, you panic, <laughs> you know, that's gonna affect how you get through that emergency. Mm -hmm. So practicing daily, putting yourself in mild stress or pu pushing fear boundaries or finding what your reactive and not logical reactions are, when you're reacting with panic um, or avoiding challenges or problems, that also has to do with survival and often we don't think about it as a survival skill, but really it is. So the more we work just on ourselves and where our heart is, uh, where our hearts are, when we're not in fear, when um, that those are survival skills. And I think it's just interesting to think about how we sometimes divide the lines. That's what I was starting to talk about with you before we turn on the mic is that we'll think of these hard skills, the lighting the fire and um, working with a tomahawk as is what you want to learn, and we'll separate them from the soft skills. How, how, why am I motivated? What moves me? What stops me? What do I let get in the way? How can I get past that? Mm -hmm. And really, there's, there's not a line. There are all those skills are connected because they're things we need as humans. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. Something else <laughs> that you mentioned in there, or something that you had said that, that kind of struck something in me was uh, something else, or, or something I feel like that you might do is put yourself in vulnerable situations. Maybe not so, so much, but you're talking about like a little bit of stress here and there. I feel like vulnerability is something that uh, more recently I've been looking into, um, and it's been fascinating of like what makes us vulnerable and um, that sense of belonging and connectedness. And, um, I don't know if you've heard of Brene Brown. Um, she has this really amazing TED talk about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's essential, yeah. like you're saying, to yeah. put yourself in those situations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, when I was at Teaching Drum, most of the vulnerability I put myself in wasn't, very, wasn't real vulnerability in physically because we were being taken care of, unless I was not being wise. But they gave us all, everything we really needed to take care of ourselves and the knowledge to take care of ourselves. Uh, emotional vulnerability can feel so real and intense and um, can be really hard to get over, but if you're facing it, you, the more you face it, the easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and I think that's, when we talk about peace in the world, when we're, not, when we're in fear, it's so hard to be peaceful. And so. And then does that fear play a role? You know, so um, in order to create peace or, or those times I am in fear mm -hmm. or that there is fear, mm -hmm. I feel almost like alive or human. Like, whew, there mm -hmm. it was. That's maybe the survival instinct mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like the, I feel like I'm gaining a skill of like, okay, I just felt fear mm -hmm. and that felt really uncomfortable and I'm okay now. Yeah. Like I got through that. Yeah. It's all right. Mm -hmm. It'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how 
sometimes, like you said, we, or, um, we might run away or push it away or avoid. Yeah. Um, and sometimes uh, I've learned big things because I just allowed myself to be scared. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it's scary to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> this this actually leads me leads me also to think about just risk assessment, which has always been something I've really been interested in. And often I'll experience this, uh, like, let's drive somewhere at night, me and my kids. But, oh, it's not safe to walk, right? It's dangerous out there to walk. And yet... It's also dangerous to be in a car. The leading cause of death for people under 32 <laughs> is car accidents. And the leading cause of death for people over 32 is connected with obesity <laughs> and heart disease. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so not walking is also dangerous. There's no place where there's no risk. But we have this culture. It's really easy to get stuck in these certain areas of it, like, ah, oh, but walking it alone at night is dangerous, whereas being chauffeured in this lovely, cushy car is safe. And um, so realizing that there's danger everywhere or there's risk or um, uh, is yeah. another aspect of that um, fear and danger facing it and looking at trying to be objective about it or creative about it. Yeah. And I'm so curious about individuals who might live in an area where violence is even more so or is more so than yeah. where we might live yeah. or less so and yeah. what are those fears that come up for yeah. people who might not see a lot of violence um, on like when they walk out their door right well and also that when we don't walk when less of us are out it actually does create a riskier environment it's a it's it's a self-perpetuating, you know, a rolling egg or a, you know, it yeah. just continues. It's a snowball effect. I mean, I feel for people who live in neighborhoods or they really feel locked in. I, I mean, it must be really challenging. So I'm not, I want to say all that with lots of empathy totally. <laughs> for the people that do feel frightened to stay inside. But how do we break out of that and make a healthier culture for all of us and know what our long run what's going to really be healthiest for all of us and and i i, I think a lot of it comes down to our, our basic needs being met mm -hmm. you know do people have food and shelter um do people have um emotional safety like mm -hmm. i feel like that's a basic need yeah physical and emotional safety yeah basic needs yeah um and then like you wow. said how do we promote <laughs> that that was cool. Yeah. That drum beat, we don't know where that came from. It just <laughs> well, appeared cool. like magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I, I kind of, when we talk about this, or, or I'm, I'm going to tell a story in just a minute, and I, and I need to say that I'm not giving advice mm -hmm. right now, but I do believe in that concept of if we shut ourselves in our homes and we don't go walking at night, then what's it going to be like if we don't? So I was going to Chattanooga, Tennessee for my second time with work. And I was so excited because I have this favorite park. There's, it's like the longest walking bridge in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, so there's just like cute little downtown area. There's like a little ice cream shop. And then there's this long walking bridge. And on the other side, there's this beautiful park and some, some stores. Uh, but this park is just like magnificent. And there's a Delta Queen, which is a steamboat, the first women, the first female captain of a steamboat. And it's over the Tennessee River. It's just like gorgeous. And so I'm on my way and I'm on the shuttle from my car to the airplane and I see a co-worker he said oh you're going to Chattanooga he's like I was just there you know a, f a few months ago he said but don't go to this park I can't remember the name of the park he said don't go to this park um, my participants told me there was just a shooting there and I said oh, okay well you know thanks for your concern and then I thought to myself and I wish I had said and or I or I did say something to him like oh you know I'll probably go but you know I'll be really aware like there's a difference in my opinion between um, being naive and being aware of your surroundings mm -hmm. um, or being afraid mm -hmm. and being aware of your surroundings. Actually, mm -hmm. there's a difference. Walking mm -hmm. down the street, being afraid mm -hmm. versus being aware. Mm -hmm. And so, but I thought to myself, well, what happens if I take his advice and everybody takes his advice mm -hmm. and nobody goes to that park anymore? Mm -hmm. Or only certain people go to the park and maybe violence increases potentially. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not saying that my way is safety um but i do feel as though i wouldn't inflict physical harm on mm -hmm. people intentionally mm -hmm. um or 
yeah, I just I don't feel like I would physically <laughs> hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting to think about um, if everybody took the other person's advice. So his mm -hmm. participants told him not to go to this park. Yeah. He told me not to go to this park. Right. And then if I continue spreading that. Yeah. What happens to the park? Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of fascinating. But I'm not. Uh, again, like I need to be aware that I ha I feel, I feel this funny. S I, f I feel a sense of security or safety. Like I yeah. feel this like I'll be protected even if I'm not here, yeah. or even if I do get hurt, or mm -hmm. like I, I, I mean, who knows? Right. Who know? I don't know exactly what will happen, but I do have this sense of confidence or. Uh, I don't know if it's a false sense of security or just a sense of security, but mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. And I feel very fortunate for that. Yeah. You know, I think I feel that too, and I, I guess that goes back to how I was saying I feel empathy. I, I know I know people who've been, like, traumatized through being attacked or beaten up and, um, and that have panic about going in situations that feel uncomfortable or areas. And um, so I, I think I've led this really privileged life and I've just been really lucky. I've had a lot of people near me that have been mugged or threatened with guns or as I say, have experienced violence, but I myself haven't experienced that violence. Right. So it's, it's a weird thing to be because I myself feel very calm, like safe, but then also like I haven't cut myself with a knife really since I was like a child. And in some ways I think I have more fear of like if I cut myself then when I did cut myself as a child it was like oh you cut yourself it's not that horrible you put a band-aid on it but now it, that it's it's both a much milder like I feel like it won't happen to me but then the idea of it happening is is like uh, for at least, the, at least the knife I think it's scarier than it really probably would be I think actually for experiencing violence I think it's more abstract for me and I can't really understand it yeah. Versus someone who's really experienced significant bodily harm due to violence can really, they know what they're scared of. And uh, But I think there's different people because other people have experienced violence and still they don't have that same sort of trauma. So. Yeah. If there's one thing that I feel like is true is that it's an individual experience. Mm -hmm. You know, trauma. Um, I talked to somebody who got shot. Mm -hmm. here uh, mm -hmm. in the neighborhood and um, was wondering if that stopped him from going out at night mm -hmm. from walking around uh -huh. um, and it was uh, not related he didn't know the person it was just random uh -huh. it was a random shooting and uh, he said that it doesn't necessarily stop him mm -hmm. um, and that he does walk around mm -hmm. wow. um, but I think the individual is the one who you know experiencing trauma it is that individual's um, experience and we all have different reactions and different emotions and yeah. triggers and yeah. uh, behavior patterns so I might subconsciously be afraid of something but not realize it mm -hmm. um, so let's just say I got I'm trying to think of an example but maybe I have this subconscious fear of stoves because maybe when I was little I got burnt but I just don't remember getting burnt but mm -hmm. now I just don't know why I don't like cooking so I yeah. stay away from the stove or yeah. wh who knows yeah. but there's this there's this like subconscious like back of the brain type of stuff um, that we may not realize is actually happening or is going on mm -hmm. and so being aware of our fears or, or, or looking at them can be really challenging um, and again scary um, so yeah but it's but it's interesting because um, somebody told me one time, and, and I'm not saying that this is true, um, but somebody said advice is could be related to somewhat like violence. Like if I'm telling you what to do, mm -hmm. then that might take away from you, or that might send the message that you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So giving advice. So I'm not saying, hey, everybody go outside and walk at night, or um, um, address your fears and go tackle you know go 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 pick up a spider if you're afraid of spiders <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that but I'm saying that people heal differently mm -hmm. there's different ways of healing yeah. so experiential mm -hmm. um, experiential he healing where I do surround myself with spiders or snakes or heights uh, can be pretty powerful for some mm -hmm. others it could actually 
um, have them get re-traumatized over and over and over again mm -hmm. where now they'll never go around spiders or never go around snakes. Yeah. So I just find it fascinating yeah. of, of what we do to yeah. heal. I, I want to say, so I took at the Traditional Ways Gathering, I took a nature uh, wilderness first aid workshop. Um, we'd also had them at a teaching gym, but I kind of wanted to see what this teacher shared with us. And one of the things she was talking about was how often in an um, emergency situation, like if there's blood or thing, um, gore or something that... Uh, we have a reaction to is that the blood will leave our heads and go to our extremities and it, it, when you have like kind of panic or mild panic that's what's happening and um, one of so she suggested is actually moving your hands and feet like jumping around and shaking a little bit that can start moving the blood around in your body so like if you see somebody else ha that has gotten an injury and you're just kind of standing there like oh what do I do one of the things you can do is move your body and move your extremities to get the blood moving again so it'll go back to your brain so you can start thinking creatively and get back to problem solving mode and addressing the situation. The other thing she talked about was just exposing yourself. So if you do see somebody that has a cut or something that's a little bit gory and you're a little bit um, afraid or just looking at it and just continuing like, mild exposure can help you um, get used to it, like you're talking about spiders or um, whatever yeah. else it would be. So, so you now we'll go back to walking around at night, maybe walk around at dusk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, baby steps, right? <laughs> right, so whatever it is that you're trying to work with, whatever the survival thing is that you want to work on or, mm -hmm. um, so. And can you think of a time that you were scared? Like truly, like, Scared, 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 wow. scared, scared. Yeah, I know I've had some, I know I've had my heart beating. <laughs> I was going to say, what happens to your body physiologically? So uh -huh. we were talking about how the blood goes to extremities, um, and we might do things to prevent that from happening, but can you think of a time when you're, like, seriously scared? Wow. Next time, ask me this before the radio show starts, Maynard. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Oh, my God. Think of something to say. Is this scary right now? <laughs> Not that What's scary, happening no. physiologically? No. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe, or I could probably, um, I... <laughs> I don't know why, but I've gotten pulled over by cops a lot because I used to have, I have older brothers and sisters. I used to get their hand-me-down cars, and I'd have like a pit at all, like one light out, like a headlight out, or mm -hmm. or I'd have um, like a tail light out. Like yeah. I just didn't keep up with my cars as yeah. much as I could have or should have when I was younger. So I had like cars when I was 16, between 16 and 18, I had like four different cars. But I had gotten pulled over a lot because of kind of having like a lemon type of car, having a car that was like breaking down, and other things too. I've gotten pulled over for speeding or or whatever it may be um but i remember when the flashing of the lights behind me my legs got numb like phys uh -huh. physically wow. like my legs were numb mm -hmm. and i and i can't i can't uh get that feeling like it, or or i should say i don't know how like i can't consciously get that numb feeling mm -hmm. in my legs yeah and so it's fascinating to just watch what happens when you're truly afraid. What's the use of that? I don't <laughs> it's fascinating. It's like, maybe it's, again, so it goes back to survival. Uh -huh. Maybe your body is doing something. But, but it's very dangerous when I'm driving and my legs go down. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's going to help me survive. But yeah, yeah I don't well, know. Well, maybe it's just like, hmm. Because this teacher had said, I guess I'd like to research this some more, that it, w it was bringing some of the blood away from your head, too, to your extremities. But, um, huh, yeah, let's, we're going to have to, I'm going to have to think about this more and learn more about it. Yeah. Because either way, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Because if that was real danger, maybe you'd need to flight, right? You yeah. You want numb legs. Yeah. Or maybe you'd need to fight and be wise. Or either one, you'd want your brain working well, right? Yeah. So, but I guess maybe before you make the decision, you need to just not do anything. Freeze. Freeze. Maybe it's a it's a healthy freeze mechanism. Yeah. Like just don't move at all until you know what's going on. Yeah, and then another effect of fear. There's there's lots of effects of of fear, both physically and then you know psychologically. And I actually I do a, a course called Trauma Informed Care. Mm -hmm. It's like a course that I teach. Mm -hmm. But we talk a lot about um, so psychologically we could start creating stories in our head. So let's just say I'm, I sit at home and I watch the news. Mm -hmm. And I hear about a story about, let's just say, 
um, maybe I know the person that's on the news, mm -hmm. okay? And they're friends of my friend. Mm -hmm. I might create stories in my head that my friend was involved in that too. Or so all of a sudden we're overreacting um, psychologically mm -hmm. and creating, or maybe there was a mugging at a parking lot. And so the next time I'm walking in that parking lot, um, the next time I'm walking in that parking lot, I might um, hear somebody behind me and then create a story that they're out to get me, mm -hmm. that they're going to hurt me. Right. So um, fear can cause us to create these stories and then have us physic then physically my body feels it because mm -hmm. I think that the footsteps behind me are somebody because I just created that. Yeah. I think this goes to kind of how I said to begin with the to s the whole day, the whole hour we have together. I suggested how we talk about this and how I thought it would tie in with the flag work that we did at Teaching Drum because it was really nice. So what we would do is if people started to get to know each other and we started noticing a pattern that someone else had um, that wasn't supportive for them growing or wasn't helping them um, do what they said they wanted to or learn or whatever it was doing, um, they could flag the person and just is all you would say is like, hey, Zayner, you, I notice you <laughs> that you're, you know, reacting to what looks like fear and not addressing this problem, or, or, you know, I, <laughs> I notice that you, it looks like you have this pattern coming up, and, and then you, or if someone was addressing me, I could just look inside me and, um, and see if it had any truth, and that's the first step I think, is before you even try to get rid of the pattern, is seeing the pattern. So what is that story? Because we all have a million stories running around inside our heads from walking through the parking lot and someone may be behind us to if I ask for help, no one will help me, or if I try to go make a friend, they'll reject me, or if I <laughs> apply for the scholarship, I won't get it, I don't have enough money, I'm messy, I'm lazy, right? We all have a million stories we have inside ourselves of how we see ourselves or how we see the world. And um, before we can do anything with those stories, we first need to see them, identify them, where do they come from, and then, do we, I want that story, is it working for me? <laughs> um, if I don't, having someone point out that I'm reacting with that story then gives me the choice, oh, that's that story or that pattern. I could change it. I have power. Now, when somebody flags you, did you ever find yourself getting defensive over that? Uh. So it's interesting. <laughs> can I even see it? If, I, if I'm reacting, again, yeah. it might be fear because sometimes yeah. we react yeah. to fear. Yeah. If I'm reacting in a way that isn't allowing me to look at it, did you find it um, or did you notice people get defensive around flagging? Yeah, we definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> and there was two different um, big aspects to that. The first was we decided to, after a while, to not react then, that, it, that we would not let ourselves be defensive at all. So even if we were feeling defensive internally, we would just say, thank you and let it lie at that. <laughs> that was all we had to do, or what we, what we agreed we would do, is just hear it, acknowledge that we heard it, and then, then it was up to us to look inside and not be defensive. Um, there was, to begin with, some like flag backs, like, <laughs> wait, I think <laughs> you're saying that because you're triggered because of this kind of thing, and it, things could get pretty messy, or, there might be a legitimate, often when people are kind of flagging, they might be feeling themselves, right? It's scary flagging somebody. So they might oh. actually be having their own reaction and have their own story and their own issue that could be flagged, but we agreed not to flag, even if there was another dynamic going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so maybe yeah. I'm complaining, right? I'm winding up a storm and, you, and you're really like irritated but you flag me for being victimized. You'd say, Sarah, you're being victimized. But I hear in your voice that you're also irritated. <laughs> I, at that point, we agreed not that I wouldn't flag you back for being irritated, irritated and victimized yourself by my whining. Because that's your job, right? You could just walk away from my whining and go do something else. So that's your story. I'm surrounded by these whiny, annoying people. <laughs> right? That <laughs> might be the story that's going on with you. But since you flagged first, I would hear your flag 
not defensive and not reactive to you and even if there might be another dynamic going on now because there's still truth probably right I, I was gonna say did you feel as though that sometimes the flagging was um, a little invalidating the feelings so maybe I really was feeling a certain way or did that come up and did that get addressed uh, I imagine uh -oh. that, I, that was huge for a lot of us I want to be seen I want to share what's really going on for me yeah it's really hard to not um, say what's really going on for you when you get a flag it's painful <laughs> it's like oh, it just just to like just hear it and uh, you feel like you're just like kind of swallowing a stone sometimes if if you uh it's like wait but the reason why is <laughs> you right. feel so vindicated right. often why you want to explain yourself mm -hmm. um but, but the feeling's well, real the feelings are real and so that's the flag isn't to say that what you're doing is invalid it's just to say you might have some choices right now and there might be some patterns in your brain that are going on you this might be a good time to look at what's going on that's all it's really at least that's all i think it's really doing is um giving you an opportunity to pause and and hear that somebody else thinks there might be something going on for you and now it's your chance to check in. Is there something really going on for me? Yeah. I know. And then practice that muscle of not being defensive. It's actually like, it's like doing push-ups. <laughs> it's emotional push-ups. <laughs> you know, it's like, rah, I will not react. It's really, yeah. I, I won't be defensive. Yeah, it's pretty tricky. Do you feel like most of the, the individuals, or a lot of the individuals who you were with, um, learned so much about themselves. I mean, I guess you can't not, obviously. Yeah. But I feel like with that sort of flagging and that process, yeah. I feel like it would make, I feel like it would force you to look at yourself so much more than yeah. if you weren't flagging each other. Yeah. And if you weren't building those relationships. Oh, I think it helped immensely. I, you, so Xander didn't have a chance. She's been out and like visiting farms and stuff. So she didn't get to listen to my talk last week because she didn't have computer access. And I don't think I talked about it that much though. I started saying that there were some young people who hadn't really done the program before, but had, were really active, like volunteers that were part of Teaching Drum that then came into the year with us. And it was amazing to see how they could work. Um, boy, I think I did tell the story, I think I told it last week about um, how one woman had really faced, no, oh boy, I think I might have, I'm going to tell the story again in case I didn't Good. tell it last week. Thanks. <laughs> if I told it again, it's a repeat, but I think I told this just at the pink house. Um, there was a, a woman who'd been in a volunteer, a younger woman, and she was asked by another woman um, if she she could move swap lodges so the one woman could move into the same lodge that she was staying in at this point we all kind of had agreed to stay in different lodges and the woman asking was staying in a lean-to and she wanted to switch over and um and, and you know i i and i was right there listening as this request came in and i my reaction i think if i had been me and i hadn't felt comfortable with it i would have kind of maybe nodded and been like yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> like, I'm almost positive that at that point, that's what my reaction would have been. I wouldn't have really spoken my truth. Um, my new friend, the, the younger woman, um, took a deep breath, and she said, I'm feeling scared to say this, but as you ask that, my first reaction is that I'm feeling resistant. And, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that it doesn't I don't feel good with it at the moment and she and then they spent an hour and a half processing <laughs> because basically she was giving her what in our culture was a huge rejection <laughs> like no I don't want you to move in <laughs> and um even though there was space physical space and um it could there was no I don't know so um yeah it was really and watching her at such, a, she, at such a young age, have that emotional maturity was so impressive for me. And I saw a number of the young people who were really working with the process there just blow me away mm -hmm. with their ability to, to be honest and really check in with what their truth was and not blame other people, not trying to be defensive, but just really 
being open and facing that really scary moment when we want to run away or protect someone else from getting hurt or whatever the different mechanisms we all have for avoiding conflict mm -hmm. and just not, not avoiding conflict, speaking up and the whole group to say things that the rest of the group, you know, had just like kind of washed over or just really, really impressive. Talk about the emotional push-ups, like just the kind of things I think that we need to to have, to have a, a healthy culture, to get through the challenges we're facing. And we need people that are really able to f look at their truth and, and speak it, let it out. Yeah. And um, this is really fascinating because we might have patterns, behavior patterns from our past that will have us go to that place of, sure, you can move in, mm -hmm. of almost like, avoid, like you said, avoiding mm -hmm. conflict. So what are the things that we do to avoid conflict? Do we just react and say something instead of consciously, so there's different different parts of the brain is actually stimulated so you have that reactor the back of the brain and it's uh, near the spine then the the midbrain there's some patterns patterns of behavior the forebrain is your consciousness and so when you flag people it's actually bringing a consciousness available it's bringing people to the forebrain mm -hmm. instead of staying in that back that reactive and the pattern mm -hmm. brain let's bring it to the forebrain okay so my oh sure you could move it or let's talk about it later is my fear in the base of the brain. That's what you're saying. Well, it might be a pattern it that might you've be. developed over right. time. That just becomes a automatic habit. A habit, automatic yeah. reaction. Yeah. And, and then you would just react. Right. So then the flag brings it back in again to my forebrain. Yeah. And then I have the opportunity to make the pattern anew, to try a different pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the practice of that, too. And do we have people in our lives who will support that? Um, so when you came back to Milwaukee, did you find yourself wanting somebody to flag you or for you to flag others? Like, did you, is that something that you kind of, how do you find the flaggers? I, I would appreciate having more people in my li life flagging me or like on board. Like I, I'm, like we went on a family um, outing this summer, you know, we were all vacationed together and um and my mother and I were like, well, let's practice flagging. So we brought it up to, as a group <laughs> to do it. And, um, and I appreciated the work we ended up doing. We ended up doing a little bit of work. And um, uh, it's nice because I have a sense that I have some of it in me. And so now it's a little easier to catch myself and bring things from my automatic to my forebrain too, once you've been flagged a number of times. Um, but um, I don't have, yeah, like cravings or regret right now, like, oh, I'm not getting it, I, I, none of that. But it, it seems like such a valuable tool that I'll take whenever I have people around that want to work with that. I'll, I think I'll be ready for it. Yeah, and with, with the family outing, did you, um, did you, did you and or your, your mom um, initiate that? Yeah. Or do you know? Yes. I can't remember who it was. It was either me or my mom. But it's just kind of cool. It up. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool where we learn something at certain points in our lives that we found find valuable and then we can actually apply it later on in life yeah. too. We, we can continue yeah. doing those things. Right, yeah. And sometimes I feel that way about uh, being childlike. Mm -hmm. Like how do we go back to the time when we were five or four or, you know, if, you're, if, if you can think of a time or somebody had me do an exercise where I could think of a time where I felt truly safe and really uh, playful and, and like just, just complete joy. Mm -hmm. And no fear. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to kind of w try to find the things in my life now that can make me feel childlike. Like I I've done flying yoga or um, partners yoga, mm -hmm. and just like flying yoga. Mm -hmm. And I, I seriously felt this giddiness, like this excitement that mm -hmm. I hadn't felt since I was like a little kid. It was like adult play. Yeah. You know, it was like, ah, like mm -hmm. a little like excited and, and a little afraid because I'm, you know, I'm kind of doing like acrobatic sort of mm -hmm. moves in this yoga. Yeah. yeah. And then also at the marsupial bridge with mm -hmm. the swings. Mm -hmm. um, when the swings first appeared at underneath the oh, bridge. Oh, I didn't know there were swings under there. Oh. I haven't been there. <laughs> oh, shucks. I, I uh, wish I didn't ruin the surprise for you, but you got to check it out. You should, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, when I saw them there, I felt truly childlike. Mm -hmm. I felt like this it's, a, it's an adult playground mm -hmm. that's what it is it's, I feel like it's an adult playground there mm -hmm. and it's just beautiful and 
and and I and I and I do crave those opportunities. And I and I do, you know, I had this time in my life I guess in my early 20s with a lot of exploration, especially studying anthropology and score, any social science, when you just learn about, if you have a time where you're just learning so much about how other people live. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I got really, com like, I had some challenges with going back to the suburbs of Philadelphia after being in Vermont and California and studying anthropology. Like, I, I went back and I had this somewhat, what I feel to be a little bit of culture shock. And it was interesting where I feel like I went to this kind of like serious place. And so one of my goals now, as um, I guess this was about five years ago, six years ago, um, but one of my goals now is to bring more laughter into my life because I can get into really deep mm -hmm. political conversations or mindfulness conversations, but when do we get to laugh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and be childlike. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, like, I, I just really need to seek those out more. I need yeah. to laugh. Yeah. Like yeah. At the, when you were at the potluck and we were playing Red Light, Green Light at my house. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah. You know? You should have come played Pat Capture the Flag with us. I know. <laughs> I know. I was trying. <laughs> How'd it go? Oh, it was great. It was really awesome. I'm going to do, we're going to do another uh, All Ages Capture the Flag sometime soon. Yes. So you'll have to keep your eye open for that. Can you post it? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I break the law all the time. Oh. <laughs> I go to the playground with my children, and it says that adults aren't supposed to play on the equipment, and I play on it. I crawl all over it, and sometimes I play with them. <laughs> <laughs> you are a lawbreaker. I am. It's terrible. <laughs> we, also, so we also sometimes do it at night after the park. You're not supposed to be there after dark. Oh, it's gosh. too late, and we go swing in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really wild and crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. You, you're not a law-abiding citizen here. <laughs> no, but that's isn't it interesting how sometimes there's even systems that get created that yeah. block us from playing. Yeah, yeah, that plays and separate us. Yeah, and this play is important for children, but it's not important. Especially, you think about what playgrounds are for children. They're this movement center, right? This creative movement, move your whole body center. And that somehow we as adults, you know, sitting at desks all day, don't need to go and get exercise and ch and like challenge ourselves, get a little bit of fear of height challenge in there and go on the top of it or whatever. Oh, yeah. We're so like, no, no, I'm a serious adult. I don't need that. I mean, our whole culture is obviously making it illegal to use that equipment. It's interesting that we all just accept it. And sometimes as we get more and more experiences, we make it more and more resistant to doing the things that we once thought. Yeah were okay, mm -hmm. like climbing trees. Or mm -hmm. I remember this one time I jumped off of a little tiny brick wall. It was maybe two and a half feet high. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I jumped differently. Mm -hmm. I jumped with much more caution and precision. Mm -hmm. And I had to re-jump because mm -hmm. it was only two and a half feet. I was yeah. like, wait a minute. Like I yeah. felt like I was aging and it was beautiful. I love aging. I really like my gray hairs. I, I just like aging. I feel like the, the older I get, the more and more comfortable I become with who I am. Mm as a person and I hope that doesn't change you know it could change um, but I, I really hope that I, I, I can maintain that like I just like aging um, but I noticed that my body in that two and a half foot jump it was like you're aging a bit or, or I jumped with a little bit of apprehension or fear yeah yeah I don't know if I was protecting my physical body, you know, my ankles or what, but I got back up on the wall and jumped down with much more gusto. Yeah, or, or, or I jumped down again. so noticed that, that it was happening to me, and that's one of the reasons why I decided I'm going to go play on playgrounds. And, I mean, I, teaching drum gave me a lot of opportunity to do that, too. But how do I keep that challenge alive while I'm home here in a city? And playgrounds is a really nice, fun, mm -hmm. easy one to do. It's really fun to go on top of them and walk. <laughs> on top of the jungle gyms and oh, you know you get to stand yeah. up there and you're probably like I don't know nine feet or seven feet off the gate yeah yeah just scary enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> or hang upside down you know I hadn't hung upside down in decades until I was like oh and the kids play a really fun game it's called wood chips hmm. where you it's a tag game and you close your eyes the person who's it and then every now and then you you yell wood chips and if anybody is touching the ground you can be anywhere on the playground equipment but you can't be touching the wood chips or the ground around the playground equipment and so if your feet are touching the ground then then you're it but you when the wood chips is called so oh it's it's really fun playing with kids I've, i'm so happy i've decided Yay. to start doing that again oh that's really wonderful yeah. and so pre-teaching drum you weren't as much i had 
pre-teaching drama, I had already said I'm going to start playing with the kids more. I wasn't going to the playground with them. We were playing really fun games in the house, like blindfolded tag um, with the lights off at night and um, some other kind of fun, just dancing. I was bringing more and more dancing yeah. in with my kids. One of my favorite memories is going into your house, and we were meeting. It was, it was before teaching drum. And I was going to work with some of your clients. And I walk into your house, and you turned on this song. And I don't know the name of the song. It was like A New Day or something. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new day. Hey, and we just danced. Brand new day. Hey, hey. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that was another time where I felt this giddy childlike play. Uh-huh. It was lovely. Uh-huh. It was lovely. And it's so nice how your energy, how, how we can exchange energy. You know, I just walked in. It was just a typical day. And you're like, you know, I really need this song, so let's just do this. Let's just do this mm-hmm. real quick. And you put it on. <laughs> and it was like, whoa, yes, let's just do this real quick. And we just danced. And it was yeah. so incredible. Mm-hmm. And I just felt so thankful for that because all of a sudden, we turned this typical day or, or what I felt to be like a, um, my mood was just mm-hmm. like kind of steady. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't really up or down or, mm-hmm. or I don't know, it was just, mm-hmm. just a typical Mm -hmm. day for me Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it was a special magical day yeah because of this literally two to five minute Mm -hmm. dance Mm -hmm. or whatever yeah and so it was fantastic to see how that can can happen yeah you know it's interesting because that brings me where I often have an emotional reaction or yeah with the flagging work or my reactivity to other people because we both can we can react to people in a way that's not supportive of our needs, right? Or like, let's say you're in a, in a crabby, bad mood, and you're gonna come in and you're, and uh, and that somehow that mood can be contagious. But it also cannot be contagious if I somehow am firm enough where I am, and if I decide how I'm gonna take mm-hmm. or not take it in. But it, it, other people's moods, I do think, has a real. There is something real about like my incur. I might be like, oh, I, and I think I was kind of in a crabby mood, so I was like, I'm gonna dance. <laughs> I'm gonna put on this song. Like that might have. I needed to shake something out. That's why mm-hmm. I did that before we started talking. Um, but I, I don't know where I'm going with this, except for just to bring up. It's one of the areas I haven't quite figured out in terms of how to navigate both accepting that moods both can be contagious and that there also are choices and and I still want to be really empowered mm-hmm. so yeah. it's just still so an area for pers- and that exchange the the relating so we have this experience where we're both experiencing each other mm-hmm. and we can uh, give energy mm-hmm. or and receive energy mm-hmm. and so you might be um, I guess kind of going back, uh, there there might be this so kind of going back to the flagging there might be this energy that I'm trying to put on you mm-hmm. or like hey i'm really upset right now and so maybe we start an argument and mm-hmm. so now you're with me so now i'm not alone right now we're together in this mm-hmm. and at least i'm not alone uh-huh. <laughs> um and then there might be other times where maybe i'm in a um maybe i'm in a bad mood or um maybe i'm sad and i don't want to give that to you so i'll turn on a song and i'll and i'll you know start dancing to the song because i i don't want to give that to you mm-hmm. so is there value in uh, I'm not saying, again, that it's right or wrong, good or bad, or giving advice, but maybe I do want you to feel sad with me, mm-hmm. and I won't turn that song on because yeah. I maybe unconsciously give you my bad mood, but I don't mean to. But, uh, so this is interesting, because if you're in a bad mood, though, and you've just come in and you're really honest, and, and if I'm like, hey, and, and maybe if I don't react with fear and push you away, like, okay, this person's in a bad mood, I don't want to absorb it, but instead I'm like, whoa release my expectations like I wish they came in in a happy chipper mood and <laughs> buoyed me up but okay this person is in a challenging mood and um and I approach them and ask do you want to share it with me do you want to and I could hear it with Ooh. you right then we can actually for me right doesn't it usually feel good to connect with someone even if they're feeling sad and then you're there to support them that can feel positive and in the way if and feel you know what is that? Joining <laughs> spirits, yeah. right? What's that? I'm yeah. not finding the words, but um, the connectedness. We can find connection yeah. in challenge and suffering. But I think it's great to ask. Like I yeah. could say, "Hey, I'm feeling really sad. Um, would you like to help me um, 
dance and turn on this song and become happy? Or would you like to hear and maybe absorb some of the sadness with me and join me? <laughs> so this makes me, I want to say, I had a friend listen to this and he said, oh my God, it was like so girly. Oh, goodness <laughs> gracious, whatever. Like, <laughs> Genderizer. So, it was so feminine. It was like a big, huge. I hope this becomes very. This was I, really feminine. <laughs> my hope is that masculine, <laughs> that this is seen as very masculine. Yeah, yeah. Let's join our feelings together. <laughs> <laughs> Share them. My my hope is that men someday yeah. will be talk, yeah. having these conversations yeah. more. Yeah. That's my that's my hope. For the I world. mean, I've actually had a number of men. I have a yeah, really yeah, close men friends who me love too. to process. I have some that really don't. Also, so right. Um, yeah. I think both are true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess it just opens up that there's when you come in with your crabby mood, I would have the the possibilities are infinite as to what our reactions could be, both mine and then yours again, mm -hmm. right? Like I might invite you to share and then you still might not want to share. And then I still, again, would be left to my own resources. Okay, this is a person that doesn't want or need my support or to connect right now. And what do I need? Or, you know, um, yeah. but this, yeah, that there's just an infinite yeah. plate yeah. of options that we could do. Yeah, and it's interesting, even in conversation, um, or, or just in this moment, you had said, you know, when you come in with this crabby mood, and a little part of me got, I was like, well, I'm not crabby right now, you know, and, and so <laughs> I'm flagging myself in my head of like, I just got defensive over Sarah giving an analogy, and it's fascinating just to watch, right, or just yeah. to see that. Right. It's like, this is what cute. is going on in my brain? And that, and it was very quick. It yeah. was like, you know, it was like, I thought yeah. that, I was like, no, 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 she's just giving an yeah. example, but... It's interesting because I'm curious if there's patterns that we create over time that lead me. Like, why would I even get defensive yeah. over that? You're wow. giving an analogy. I knew you were giving a story or analogy the whole conversation. Yeah. This yeah. whole time. Right. But is, or was it fear? Like, I don't want people really to think that maybe I was crabby beforehand. Ooh, you yeah. Know. Maybe image <laughs> or like, and, and, and I was taught, um, I was taught to love everyone. Um, but I wasn't necessarily taught that it's okay not to like someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I still don't know how I feel about that. You know, like, like I, I was just given these messages of like, <sighs> yeah, you gotta, you have to love everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think you can have love in your heart, but I think that there's also this really important thing to just recognize when there is contention and then also to allow possible n emotions like anger or frustration or vulnerability or fear to come out in conversation because quite often I'll facilitate meetings mm -hmm. and I'll find myself uh, paraphrasing what people are saying, trying to reflect back to them what they had just said, but I quite often am, am looking to move forward through the conflict mm -hmm. instead of just allowing the two individuals at the table to really argue. Mm -hmm. And my friend one time said, hey, Xander, just let it go. Like, just let them argue. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it was fascinating because at the end, that's what they needed. Uh -huh. They huh. needed to get it out. They needed to yell at each other. Even though I was super uncomfortable at the table, like, all right, let's refocus. Let's get back. So what you're saying is this. Your intention, both of your intention is that you want this. Mm -hmm. You both have the same intention, but how you're getting there looks different. And I was seriously going through this whole thing of trying to avoid conflict or mm -hmm. for them to avoid conflict because I felt uncomfortable at the table with them yeah. yelling at each other. Mm -hmm. I did not like the yelling. Mm -hmm. And I and I know since I was a little kid, I did not like yelling. Mm -hmm. My family, my mom and my dad um, rarely raised their voice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they had different tones, you know, like mm -hmm. pick up your shoe. Or would I, they had different tones. Yeah. But when I would go to friends' houses and their families were sh screaming, mm -hmm. I had a real... That was traumatizing for me, yeah. actually. Yeah. And so now I'm just noticing that I have this pattern wow. to avoid it. I want, um, that's interesting. I was going to say the other thing is about them, if they're, you know, getting to this full-fledged argument or, and you are trying to help them, is that you don't enable them to figure it out. I mean, you want to both role model, right? let them hear the language that they maybe could have, but if they're not open for it, or once you've given it to them, then it's their responsibility. They're not going to, you're not going to be there every time, right? You're just a crutch in this one instance, but they need to figure out how to and, do it. And I, and I realize that unsolicited help sometimes can really be um, disheartening. Yeah. Like to offer help when somebody doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. I, I found that to be a big lesson of mine of, 
it's almost like patronizing if I feel like I'm trying to help somebody yeah. versus being aligned with their value system. Right. Or, um, so this one time, just a, a quick story. Um, there was this woman who lived in her car, and I thought it would be a good idea to give her five dollars. Mm-hmm. So she had a, it was winter time, and she had a little crack in her window. Uh, she had gone into a store, mm-hmm. and she had her window rolled down just a bit, mm-hmm. like just like a little bit. Yeah. And I stuck the five dollars in in the window, mm-hmm. and it fell under the seat. And I was really nervous she wouldn't see it. Mm-hmm. So I, I should not have done this, by the way. Mm-hmm. So I open the door and I get the $5. I put it right on her seat and I shut the door. Well, she comes out and she says, what are you doing? I was in her personal space. Yeah. That was her life. Mm-hmm. I accidentally locked her out of her car because her car door only shut a certain way. Like you can't shut it all the way. Oh. And so I realized that was unsolicited help. She did not ask me for $5. Uh-huh. What if she has a whole bunch of money? I assumed. Yeah. I was so naive and young and I assumed all this stuff yeah yeah and I you know it was just really huh. so there's an example of unsolicited help is yeah. not always yeah I don't think that um I think we need to look for empowerment mm-hmm. versus helping someone yes wow that's a powerful story <laughs> yeah I, and again those life lessons you know um, I know we have like a few minutes yeah. before we finish up, and I kind of feel like our the last time we were together, we we really got into like okay, what's this going to be? Here we are on uh-huh. center is the yeah. name of our show, yeah. Um, and we were brainstorming, and um, I'm curious if we can continue just a little bit of that brainstorming or almost like revisit what we had decided or think about a topic for next week, uh-huh. or or think about do we want to do topics because we had so many ideas, yeah. You know, and we still have so many yeah. ideas, yeah. And and um, one thing that is on my mind is that Rob Hopkins from Transition, oh yes, um, from the Transition Movement is coming in How a few soon weeks. Though? Um, he's coming October fifteenth uh, and sixteenth, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sorry, fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth. So the sixteenth is a, this big event that we're going to have, and the details are coming together. Uh, so Wednesday night, October sixteenth, uh, save the date. There's going to be a big event. I'm having a two-day transition launch training on the 14th and 15th. So uh, last summer, um, Milwaukee folks sponsored me to go get trained in the transition launch training on how to teach it. Mm -hmm. So on the 14th and 15th, I'm doing a two-day launch training uh, to help people start a transition initiative or go deeper within their transitioning uh, from uh, fossil fuels to local resiliency. And so... Uh, that's just something that within the next few weeks I'd love to talk a little bit more about you and I in particular about how folks in our community are transitioning Mm -hmm. Um, also I had mentioned the swings earlier there's this great um, there's this great website Mm -hmm. beintween.com do you know much about it? I, you know, I know that he set up the competition. Oh yeah. And um, you know, otherwise I think like been out of town. Yeah. So when Keith, all that happened, Keith Hayes. Much, and yeah. Yeah. So, so those are just like like Keith Hayes being between just local individuals who are doing uh, power down type of stuff, um, building um, building community and empowering the community. Uh, so that was something I was thinking about talking about, but what about you? What are your thoughts for next week's topic or within the next couple weeks? <sighs> There's so much. I mean, part of me thinks this was kind of fun and we could just kind of keep just this huge conversation going and rambling, <laughs> you know, and move cool. on to, like, relationships. I would we love have that. But, um, or... Was this also just could continue the conversation in terms of what does this mean in terms of transitioning if we're not going to enable ourselves to, um, oh, I would love to talk about the Possibility Alliance, too. I got this amazing zine from this uh, intentional community in Missouri that's just so beautiful. Uh, so maybe we could talk about uh, transitioning and, and how it, it connects with the conversation we just had today, too, because there is, like, individual responsibility and we don't want to be forcing other people who don't want help right everything we just said is connected with that yeah um and we're we're enabled right we have this huge amount of energy enabling us to not live in a lifestyle that's really healthy for us and for our planet so Mm -hmm. where do we go from there and what are other people doing Mm -hmm. we might be kind of need to talk about yeah and and again it could go all over the place i just i i really appreciate that that here is our venue uh-huh um uh, when you and i get some real quality time yeah and so uh 
So I appreciate all the listeners out there allowing us to kind of yeah. plan it as we go on yeah. air. <laughs> and I appreciate that. We have some listeners, too. We've had some people checking in. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's neat. Thanks, Joe, for listening. <laughs> and um, can you remind me of that end sentence that we said together uh, the first time? Um, well, did we? I, I can't. We said, Nin zagi i wei win. We are constantly in a state of being beloved. Can we say it together? Yeah. Oh, should we say both of it? Yeah. Um, well, no, we can say I'm the second part. Zagi, i wei win. Zagi, i win win. <laughs> Close enough. Nin zagi i wei win. But let's say this uh, English part together. We are constantly, we are constantly in, in a state, state of, of being, being beloved. beloved. <laughs>